Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tyne, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? Hey, Benny. I'm great, man. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. It's a awesome. great weekend. Awesome. Cool weather. Uh, not, not cool weather, hot weather, but like great weather. <laughs> oh, awesome. And, uh, yeah, awesome, awesome weekend all around. So, yeah, yeah nothing, Me nothing too. to say about that. <laughs> I, I, I've got stuff to say, but it's really not relevant. But So I apologize in advance, but I just want to say it because it was amazing. Uh, me and my fiance took off to uh, a cabin on the West Coast that didn't have cell service or internet and just chilled oh, out wow. there for like three days. And it was so fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth swearing about. It was so good. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah, like it's just a great unplug, come back refreshed and, and ready to crush some some good good stuff and uh, yeah yeah it's so awesome but well on our last night there we actually went into the city broke the rule of staying unplugged and went into the city and we went and saw Cirque du Soleil um, oh, wow. which I, I assume goes to Germany as well because it, it, it seems to go everywhere but um, it I've was so it before, cool yeah. yeah yeah it was incredible and like there was some incredible musicians that were part of the performance too and it actually it made me remember that Way back when I was doing this drumming documentary years ago, uh, we we got to uh, interview and record a drummer who I'm pretty sure his name was Eman. Her name was Emanuela Capellet or something like that. Sorry if I'm butchering that, but she she drums for Cirque du Soleil, and like she was describing how they like they've got tracks they have to play with, but they also have to be able to keep loops going in case. The, the person needs more time to do their crazy stunt, you know? So they have to like mm-hmm. try and time it with like the downbeat beam when they land or something like that or or cutting off when they jump kind of thing. So it's like this crazy freeform thing that they're watching a, a performer do all this wild stuff and adapting the music to that. I just can't imagine how hard that would be. It'd be like oh, yeah. playing a live show and like trying to time the song to the audience in front of you as they're moving around the bar. <laughs> like <laughs> So crazy. So crazy. Anyway, yeah, I thought to- that'd be interesting for people. Oh yeah, to- totally interesting. And I-, I think I have to go and watch that again because to be honest, it, it was, I don't know how many years ago, like decades ago that I saw, as I've seen it with, I-, I went there together with my dad and I was just, I remember I was just too, looking back now, I was just too young and stupid to really appreciate what was going on there. I was like a skateboarding punk kid and I didn't care right. about any of that at all. To me, this was all just stupid, boring, and I didn't get it. You know, so, <laughs> so I think I, I think now I could appreciate much more than I did back then. Uh, but Probably. Like, yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely impressive, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally cool. suggest checking it out if it comes comes near you. So, oh yeah, I would I would definitely like to. That's one of the th- <laughs> things I, I I actually kept thinking about quite a bit um, because I, I I was so I don't know I couldn't appreciate any of those. Things back then it was all just all I wanted to hear was like three chords as loud as possible that I could yeah, skate to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Things change. Uh, it's things wild. change. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> yep. All right. Cool. So before we dive into today's episode, I have to ha- say one thing. I got an email from um, one of our listeners, and he discovered us on YouTube, not through the podcast apps. And I thought oh, this cool. email and what was in this, this this email is very, very interesting and and helpful for us. And also, I have to mention it to our uh, tell our audience because for us, YouTube is n- it's just a thing where we automatically upload episodes, sort of, um, so that you can discover us there too. But we're really focused on the podcast apps. So on YouTube, there's the video. But it doesn't have a fancy intro and outro, and it doesn't. It's not like prepped the way a typical YouTube video is prepped. And our listener who reached out to me was like, "Your content and your your topics are so good, but like if you would do it more like YouTubers do, and you add a hook at the beginning, and you do this and you do this, then it would be so much better to follow along and so much more. You know, all these things." And mm-hmm. he's totally right with everything he says. I just want to point out if you discover this on YouTube and you're wondering why this is such a like long form thing without the typical, you know, all these things, you might want to check out the show on Apple Podcast or Spotify or any sort of podcast app because there we have an intro and an outro and there's a little hook in the beginning and it's like the overall delivery is like better than on YouTube. That being said, right. we want to do YouTube videos in the future and if we do those, we do them properly. But for now, if you're confused about the low number of views or why this is the way it is, it's because it's a podcast and not a YouTube channel that we focus on. So I thought maybe you're not yeah. the only one um, feeling like the, uh, that. And and if so, if you're watching this on YouTube, 
just know that there is an actual podcast that you can subscribe to and listen to. And that makes much more sense in that format. Uh, for, if you enjoy us watching as we talk, then keep watching it on YouTube, though. And yeah, then, if you like yeah. it, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing that I, that was also, it was a long email with a lot of good points. So he was totally right about everything. The other thing that I have to mention, because maybe more people got that wrong. He said, like, in one of the previous episodes, the last one or the one before, I don't know, he said that I started the conversation by telling people that I haven't prepared anything for today. And then he was like, why should I then watch if you aren't prepared? And I listened <laughs> back to that episode and there was a misunderstanding. I said, I haven't prepared anything for today's banter. And I asked you if you have any <laughs> like pr private story, you know, fun story to share that you always do in the beginning. So, of course, we were prepared for the episode. It was a list episode even, so we had our whole outline and everything. I just didn't have any other any new story prepared because it was the second episode in a row and all of that. So, in case more of you were wondering about why I get go into these episodes not having prepared anything, that was not what I was saying. <laughs> That's just something I need to clarify here in case you got that wrong too. I was just talking about the banter about our, like little fun talk at the beginning of, being of all the episodes. Maybe, that, maybe that's, that's why he was there. Maybe he, maybe he listens in for the banter. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. No, one of his points was actually that the banter is so long and that we should get to the point earlier. <laughs> yeah, we probably should, instead of talking about the circus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah, so those two things. I just wanted to clarify those. And I, I was very grateful, uh, very thankful for him pointing that out because, you know, maybe more people are wondering, like, well, what's this all about and don't realize that it's an actual podcast on an app. So, yeah, all day. All right, good. Today's episode. Um, we're almost, yeah, we're almost 10 minutes in. So now I think it's time to talk about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so today's episode is about guitar tone. It could be about any any signal, but I've chosen uh, guitar tone because um, this is the primary thing where I encountered this. And it's about why your, we're going to talk about why your awesome, sick, perfect guitar tone might be ruining the mix because you might be judging it without context and you might be dialing it in in a vacuum without the context of everything else. And we think that it's super important to always listen to things in the context of other things and to tweak things in the context of the mix. That's all that matters because it doesn't matter what your instrument sounds like on its own. It's about whether or not it serves the song and whether or not it fits into the perfect mix for the tune you're working on. So... Mm -hmm. The reason why I wanted to bring this up is that when I talk to artists about, about artists about their sonic vision, the project, so many people mention the guitar tones that they like, and I don't know why it's guitar, but that's that's one of the most common thing that come things that come up. They they either like I don't know bright guitars or dark guitars, or they hate or love scooped mid range, or they want uh, a dark full sound, or I don't know. But guitar tone is always part of their vision, or almost always drums too. But the guitar tone is the, the popular one especially if I'm talking to guitarists, then all they care about is the guitar right. tone. And I think that these personal preferences are obviously a thing and very important, but a lot of people completely ignore the fact that this tone has to work in the context of the mix and the arrangement. And sometimes that means that what they think would be a great guitar tone that they love ends up being a very bad choice for the project. So I'd love to discuss how to actually figure out um, a great tone, to get a great tone that you like, but that also fits into the whole thing, basically. And and to me, there's three angles that I want to look at it today, and I want to talk to you about that, Malcolm. Uh, it's I look at it from the perspective of of the song, the intention, the message, and the overall vibe of the song. Like, does the guitar tone work with that for that? Like, does that make sense with the intention and how the song's supposed to feel? Then I look at it from the arrangement perspective, and then I look at it from the mixing perspective, the technical side of things, basically. Um, so right. these are the three, three angles that I that I uh, like to come from um, here. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, what do you think about all this? Something I didn't expect you to say that I totally love is that you said that this really actually applies to any element of like of a song. Like it, it we're we're talking about guitars, but you can uh, you can take this approach and, and like uh, kind of train of thought and apply it to any instrument. Like that have like what snare you're using in the song, what kick you're using in the song, um, even vocal sound. It, it's it's pretty relevant regardless. But for some reason, guitars are, are pretty hard to pin down. And I almost think it's because people have too much of an idea of what they're looking for before they've started recording. And it's out of context, right? So, you know, they're listening, like you said, to some completely different song by a different band with different gear. And they're like, I like this guitar sound. But that means nothing when you don't have this canvas of your own song to, to plop it into and, and hear it that style of tone 
in the song. It just it is just not relevant until you've done that. Until you've got it working with other parts, it's not really. I mean, it's it's good to have ideas. So you because as we're going to talk about our processes, it's going to speed up the the hunt probably. But it it doesn't. You, you really have to think beyond the guitar tone to come up with a guitar tone. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. I think this is one of those episodes where audio examples would actually be very helpful. I think where to like, you know, point out the problems or like show how how things work or don't work in the context of the mix. And this is one. Mm-hmm. Again, back to the whole YouTube th- thing, what we planned and on doing, and I'm, I'm very close to actually starting that, by the way. I'm, I know I've been saying this for a while, but I, I keep working at it all the time. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to, in the future, we're going to do extra YouTube videos to show the things that we talk about on the podcast so the two will go together. Because audio, I, th- I thought about audio examples in the podcast, and for a number of reasons, that's not so good of an idea because some podcast apps only play in mono. Others have right. horrible compression where it's like a very bad MP3 that just sounds horrible and you can't hear the details anyways. So it makes much more sense to have a dedicated shorter format on YouTube with great sound where we can show and 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 and, and execute those things and like t- show you how to do it and um, along with those episodes. And I guess this is one of those that I have to do pretty early on because there's so much that we talk about today that is kind of hard to describe, but very obvious that once you hear it, but we're going to do our best to, to still make it work. So... Yeah, uh, one and two of that of those three perspectives, like the song and the arrangement, to me have to do with um, with with writing and arranging, with the final sound in mind. Uh, and again, this goes for all sources, but we'll talk about guitar specifically, as well as understanding uh, the importance of choosing the right instruments, the key, the tuning, all of that. So you can optimize what you're writing and which instruments you choose, and all of that. You can optimize that when you have the the outcome in mind and the mix in mind and all of that. And all three of those, like the song, the arrangement, and the mix, have a lot to do with understanding the frequency spectrum. So understanding where each instrument typically lives, where the typical problem frequencies are, and how to, how each part of the spectrum also feels, sort of. Like, there's this, you know, these words that you hear all the time when somebody says, this sounds boxy, or this sounds muddy, or this sounds aggressive, or abrasive or, I don't know, harsh or whatever. So in order for you to, to be able to understand those terms better, to know where in the spectrum those things are and where each instrument's t- instrument typically lives and parts of it, uh, I've prepared a free frequency chart cheat sheet for you. And if you go to the selfrecordingband.com slash frequency chart, you can download that. And uh, it can it can help you a lot. If you are wondering what to do about that muddy those muddy guitars or how to address whatever in your in your tone or why that it clashes with the vocals where the overlaps are you can have a look at this frequency cheat sheet and definitely find good starting points and uh, the more you do that the more you learn and the less you're going to need the, this cheat sheet but it's a great starting point and I've prepared it for you to make more sense of everything that we're talking about today so again if you go to the selfrecordingband.com slash frequency chart then uh, you might want to re-listen to that episode and look at these frequencies and then try it out for yourself and it will all make much more sense. So, Yeah, it, yeah. it's a totally great resource. Definitely grab it. It's kind of, when you're getting in, there's it's almost like you're learning a new language. I'm sure people have found that listening to this podcast. They're hearing words that we use all the time that are not part of their normal vocabulary. And over time, as you record more and, and you know chat with people like us more, these words become more and more familiar and eventually work their way into your own vocabulary as well. And uh, actually, I get messaged all the time about how I say bombastic, which I feel like I haven't said in a little while, but I, <laughs> but I, I do re- use that word. I can't remember you ever saying that. Honestly. Really? Okay, yeah. I people, Multiple people have messaged me being like, I love the word bombastic. <laughs> bombastic. <laughs> Did they message you because they heard you say it on the show? Or like... On, on the podcast, yeah. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> awesome, awesome. And yeah. uh, I, I know I've used it on my other podcast too, so uh, that, that comes up. But um, the reason I'm bringing up this vocabulary stuff is because w- what I really recommend if, if you're trying to collaboratively build um, a guitar tone, it's super helpful if you're speaking the same language. So if you grab like an amp and it's got, let's say, bass, mid, treble, presence, like that's a pretty common setup. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But those are all pretty, pretty common. Play with those and figure out what you know. What does presence actually mean? Mean versus treble, um, and and what is mid range? I mean, mid range 
these can all be tuned pretty differently across amps, so it's not an exact science, but it's going to start giving you some idea. And the idea is that if you can describe the sound you're looking for using an actual technical term that, that relates to a control, like, oh, I want it to be more mid-forward, to an engineer, like if you're working with an engineer, or hopefully you're... you're your mind is starting to think like an engineer, that becomes much easier to accomplish versus yeah. uh, aggressive. Uh, like uh, Aggressive would probably make me go mid-forward. I would probably try and get a very transient heart attack on some upper mids or something like that. Yes. But if they just said aggressively mid-forward, I would be like, I know exactly what you mean. Very quick yeah. kind of thing. So l- learning this language is going to help you communicate the tone you're hunting uh, quicker. 100% definitely. And there's always going to be, yeah, different people are going to use the same words slightly differently, but there's still one, I think, a common understanding of certain terms and things get repeated all the time. And uh, yeah, de- definitely. I, I, yeah, I agree with everything you said there. So, okay, let's dive in, I'd say. And, and again, if you grab that download and then come back maybe to the episode later or listen to it now and then come back uh, if there's some things you just don't understand right now, that cheat sheet will definitely help. But Let's start with the most basic of these, or the it's it's kind of the most what not the most important, but the the easiest to understand, I think, um, mm. concept of those three and and perspectives of those three, and that is does the tone that you're dialing in, does that and that you like, like you start probably you start by dialing in a tone that you just like standing in front of your amp or coming out of the speakers or your headphones, you just you know you jam you play and you think that's the that's the sound I like. Maybe you compare it to some references that you have and you come up with that guitar tone, but you basically do it in a vacuum. And now the first question to ask yourself is, does the tone you create there, does that does that tone create the intended feeling, like evoke the intended emotions? Does it cause the right emotional reaction overall? Like forget about the context for now, but is the tone not only cool, but does it do what you want the song to do? So, you know, if, right. if the song's supposed to be like abrasive sounding and like a little harsh on purpose, maybe like the Kurt Blue productions or the very raw, you know, punk hardcore productions. Is that a song like that? Is that the aesthetic of your band? And does the sound do that? Or is it way too smooth and slick and polished for that? Or the other way around, do you want a very polished, slick radio rock type of sound, but it's like actually really harsh and, uh, you know, and, and way too hard on the pick attacks or whatever, you know, does... Does, does, does the aesthetic you're going for overall match the tone you have? And if there's an emotional reaction that you want to create, does it do that? Does it does it work for the happy song, the sad song, the angry song? You know, it, that's the first question I would I would ask myself if the overall direction is right. Because sometimes you just mm. like what you hear for whatever reason, but it's still not what you should use for the song. If like if you if you think about the big picture, right? Yeah. So, so essentially, you're saying like, yeah, does it give the right emotional reaction, right? Does that convey the the feeling of the song? And what do you think technically are the main contributors to to getting that right? Okay, to me, one thing um, is definitely the upper mid range, like the how how aggressive something is, or how pleasing to listen to something is. Um, <laughs> that's one thing. If yeah, that's what I when I listen to guitars. That's one of the first things that I notice. That is it sounding like? Has it, does it have the an edge, or is it like very clean and like smooth sounding yeah. in a way? Even if it's very distorted, it can sound very clean in a way. If you know what I mean. So is it like absolutely? If, yeah. if I turn it up loud, can I do that without any pain, or is it like getting painful after you know a certain volume? And that can be yeah. intentional or not. So that is one thing that just makes me feel different about a song. Um, or makes yeah makes me feel different when I listen to a song, and then the other thing I think a lot of the emotion to me is in in the low end and the lower mid range also for whatever reason when things are have a lot of low mid range and are full and warm sounding it's the more intimate it's it's closer it's more intimate it's if there is like a a lot of low end that's I don't know that um, that always carries a lot of the a lot of the emotion and a lot of the, the what I react to when I listen to music. If there's not a lot right. of low end, it sounds a little more distant. It might sound more. It, it might sit better in the. But that, that gets into the whole context thing, so I don't really want to talk about that. But in general, if I hear, hear an isolated sound that is full, quote unquote, warm, has a lot of low end to it, that tends to connect differently w- with me, and that is a little more. 
I tend to I don't know I don't know how to say that even yeah no maybe it's no, be, so, maybe it's because the fundamental notes are louder I just connect better to the melody to the chord chord progression the actual uh, yeah, that's musical a, that's a good content point, actually. The actual musical content, yeah. whereas if the lower mid range is lacking, and I hear more of the fizz, for example, or more of the aggressive upper mid range, that's also a feel. But that's less about the musical content and more about the overall power and the aggression and like how abrasive something is. And I connect differently depending on those things. Right. I think. So, but that that's not. I mean, those are actually all really great points, especially the the fundamental note being present, making a, a emotional connection. I love that actually, but. But I think what I'm really trying to get to is like how do you how do you achieve this? And I don't think it's okay. by grabbing an EQ, right? It's yeah. not uh, like oh, I want the d- does this guitar have the right emotion? No, is crank the mid range. That's not really going to do it, right? Yeah. So I I think probably what is and, and things people should be thinking about when they're on this step, how, making a guitar tone that has the right emotional reaction, is is probably number one the player. I think the player oh, yeah. is probably going to impact that decision the most. Number two might be what guitar they they pick up, and in, like so, if they you know if they grab a Strat versus a Les Paul, those are going to convey completely different things. I think yes. once put into the song, kind of thing. Um, and then after that, might be like like gain gain structure, gain type. You know, like there's overdrive, distortion, or or fuzz, and like stuff like that. Like those all pretty much make them different instruments in a way, right? <laughs> yes, totally, um, but totally. Yeah. Like, if you reduce it to these big blocks that if you change this, it's going to be a very different result. So, like, player, guitar, gain type, and then, you know, speaker we've talked about. Like, those are, like, the big changes that that actually lead to emotional changes, I think. Would you agree I with that? So. I, I totally think so. Yeah, I totally agree. And I would say... This is one of the things that's so hard to describe because we're talking about emotion. We're talking about feeling here. And and you said that the player is so important and I totally agree with that too. So I think a great way of, of figuring that out for you and finding out what's right is if you have options and or if you can borrow a couple of guitars or a couple of amps or if you have amp sims available or whatever, if you have any sort of options, during pre-pro uh, or practice or whatever, try to experiment a, a bit with those things and then try to forget about any technical things. Try to forget about frequency response and EQ curves and all of that. Try to really focus on how the performance feels when you play it. And if you're the player, focus on how you interact with the sound you're hearing. How If that is actually an expression, if that feels like you're expressing yourself through playing and if that, like how that feels and how you connect with the tone. And you will, you will notice when it's just right. You will notice when it's wrong and you will notice when it's right. When it's wrong, it's like, yeah, sounds cool, but it's not really inspiring. But when it's really right, it feels like an extension of yourself. It's like, it's the perfect thing. It's like, um, and you can only figure that out if you experiment for a bit. Because if you have a good setup with a good guitar and a good amp, it probably will sound decent. But it doesn't mean it's the ideal thing emotionally. But if you can try a bunch, like if you have something like, say, Tone Hub by STL, it's a great tool for that because it's simple, similar to a camper, or if you have a camper, same thing, where you can like go through presets basically of whole rigs mm-hmm. with different vibes and stuff, and you can quickly try a few different things and see what what works um, and and how it feels while you're playing through it. And if you have a couple of guitars, you can do the same thing. And again, forget about the technical things. Just pay attention to how it feels. Like how does the guitar react? How is the the sustain? The palm mutes? The you know all these expressions, and um, and that's I think what you sh- what you have to do to find your own voice and to find your own thing and to find what's right for the song. You just have to experiment with. Yeah, I think that's just part of the process, and that's that's basically it. And that's the first question that I would really ask myself because chances are the reason why I brought this up is that you probably if you have a decent amp and a decent guitar and you can play, then if you stand in front of it you might be able to fi- to dial in a tone pretty quickly that you just like and where you think this is the ideal thing, this works, it sounds great. But again, that doesn't really mean that for this song it's the right thing. So you have to try alternatives and, and really think about the emotional side of it. And maybe it's something that it's, it's, it's not your obvious first choice, but actually much better for the song. Right, yeah. yeah. And yeah, so like step one was, was does, you know, making sure the tone has the right emotional reaction. And yes, then step two on our list was, does it play with the other elements in your arrangement? And that, I mean, that, like, that is very similar to step one in, in a lot of ways, but it, it's kind of just shifting your focus from the guitar to the rest of the things and making yes. sure that they are being complemented by, by the tone you've chosen. I, I've had the luxury of almost exclusively working with live drums. So by the time I get to guitars, 
there's something that is not going to change about the the drum like the song you know like the 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 drums are a, a recorded instrument that are going to be what gets used in the mix um yeah. to you know to varying degrees the it's not like a virtual drum instrument where i could just totally change the instrument and now the drums were recorded in a different room entirely you know um, Absolutely. So that makes this really easy <laughs> for me. It's where I can be like, okay, how does the guitar work against the snare and the cymbals? Because th- those are going nowhere. They're going to be there for me. I know for the whole thing. If that's not the case for your production, I think my ad- only advice would be that maybe you should try to choose your drum sound earlier if you can. But uh, it's just not always... Sometimes you're just using the free virtual drummer and you know your mixer engineer is going to choose what they want to use later. Yeah, but yeah, agreed. the performance and, mm-hmm. will still be there. So I think yeah. it's still possible to get this yes. right. Yes, I agree. And uh, I want to make sure that people know, that uh, to, at least I want to separate these two things, like number two and three. So when I say it's about the arrangement, it's not so much about, it's not about the mix in terms of like which frequencies and overlaps and all that. That's, the, again, another thing to keep in mind while you're recording, like having the mix in mind. But when I talk about the arrangement, I mean, similar to like you would, you would put together an, an orchestra or something where each part of it has a certain function and has to sound has to have a certain sound in order for for it to fulfill that function that purpose so what i mean is does the tone play well with the other elements in your arrangement meaning what what's the purpose of the instrument or part and does the tone help achieve that so an example so that you know what i'm talking about let's say you have you have drums that's the pulse that's the 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 rhythm but like not rhythmic like not not har- there's no harmonic element to it it's like just transients and like impact, pulse, you know, groove, whatever you want to call it. But then you want to have another rhythm element that plays along with that groove, but also provides a harmonic like foundation. So you can have like a bass guitar or can be a guitar, can be something that sort of plays together well with those drums while providing something in between the drum hits, you know, and in that together will mm-hmm. give you the overall groove of the song. And then you might have another, and you can have like that can be the bass, that can be the bass and the guitar together, that can be just the guitar, or I don't like different, there's different ways of doing that. And then let's say if you if the, the bass and the rhythm guitar together are doing that, so the drums, the bass, and the basic rhythm guitar are providing the groove and the basic chord progression for the song, you might have another guitar that is there for another reason. That could be a harm, like additional harmonics higher up in the spectrum. It could be a melody. It could be a call and response thing in between whatever the rhythm section does. You know, it could be a different function. could be playing along with the lyrics, the the lead melody and supporting that. could be a call and response with that. could be all kinds of things, but it's there for a reason. And does the tone you choose help get that, like achieve that? So... One example where it wouldn't achieve that is if if you want a thick, um, if you have like a rhythm guitar that plays the basic chord progression and that provides sort of the foundation for the song together with the bass, if that is a really thin, you know, high frequency focused sort of sound, it will, won't do the job very well. It has to blend with the bass fundamentals and there has to be, there will be some overlap, but it also will go well together and it has to provide a thick sort of full sounding foundation if you play palm mutes you don't want to be you don't want those to be very tinny and thin sounding you want the feeling of air being moved it's part of the groove it's part of what's making the speaker mm. move so you need a tone that actually does that it can't be too thin because otherwise that that doesn't work especially when it comes to like low tuned palm, palm mutes or something like that you know or any of those things or if you want to add like octaves or like a elite melody that has to cut through but you have still have to be able to make it quiet because it shouldn't step on top of the vocal you probably can't do that with a very dull sound because that will always be sort of buried or you have to turn it up really loud and then we'll, it will mask everything else. So you know what I'm saying. There's in an yeah. orchestra, there's a violin and there's a cello and there's a, con- a bass and all those things and they all have a purpose. And in a band, there's these different elements and they have a purpose. And you have to make sure that the tone you choose does help achieve that. And sometimes, or oftentimes, you only know that after you've listened to it in context because on its own, it might sound really good, but overall, in the context of everything, it might completely fall flat. Okay, here's here's an example that I think everybody's heard at least once that's just always terrible, is when the, the verse 
like there's a big intro or big chorus and then it goes down to a verse that should have an acoustic strum guitar but they just like turn off the distortion pedal on the electric guitar and it's just terrible <laughs> strumming along like an acoustic guitar um like yep. that that that's just brutal and and yep. obviously doesn't do the same job sure it's a cleaning six stringed instrument you know playing cowboy chords but if it it doesn't sound like the same instrument at all really um so so like that's that's a prime example of the arrangement not being satisfied and fulfilled by what you've chosen to use. Oh yeah, oh yeah, great, great example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, or, so, <laughs> <laughs> just just thinking about you know the other one you hear is uh, when somebody uses an acoustic guitar, but they use the plug in, so it sounds like a zipper being opened and closed to me. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> just like oh, so close, but so far. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah, totally, totally. That's that's a good one too. Yeah. The acoustics and with bass sometimes too honestly if you know there's a difference between a bass that's that's playing high up on the neck all the time and and doing a lot of bass runs and licks and fills versus a bass and, and being played with a pick and like distorted and all of that versus a bass that's like holding down the the fundamental notes only and it's like very smooth and played with your fingers and like you know that's a different function in in the mix it's both a bass, but the one is, right. is is almost almost is almost the guitar, and the other one is like a more traditional bass, and they need different tones in order for them to work in the arrangement and to serve their purpose. And if you if you decide to go with the guitar like bass and you play runs and fills all the time and you're high up on the neck, maybe you need another low end instrument to do to, to you know to make up for that because the bass doesn't really do that. You need something else to hold down the low end and and keep it all together. So. Yeah, those are the the decisions you have to make, and it's it's partly do it's a, a writing question. It's it's about picking the right instruments, and it's then about picking a tone that helps the instrument do do its job in the context of the arrangement. Right. Yeah. Great points. Cool. And then number third, uh, number three, num- number third, <laughs> number three is that <laughs> will the tone work in the mix? So. The decisions have been made. The song is arranged. You know which parts you're going to play. You know which instrument is working well for that. You've chosen the amp and the basic tone and all of that. And now it's more detailed work when dialing in the tone or or, or putting the microphone in place, you know, make placement and all these things. So this is a little more detailed now. Will the tone you have, will that work in the mix? Meaning, how well do the different sounds that you've chosen in your arrangement, how well do they interact? There can be overlaps. There can be things masking other things. You know, there's the, there's the thing. You don't have to have a completely... You don't have to have every part of the frequency spectrum completely filled. There can be gaps in them if they in, in there if they are intentional. Um, but you have to know, mm-hmm. like, where, where, where are those gaps? Are they intentional? Are there overlaps? Are there... Like, where do I place things? And, um, and this takes time and experience and practice as, as so many things. But I really, I really do believe that you have to think about those things early on, and not in, not only in the mix. It really helps to capture source tones that are somewhat in the ballpark and not completely off, you know. Because everything will be better. The rough mix will be better. You have a better understanding of what the final song is going to sound like. It's more fun to play to that. It's my, you just make better decisions overall, and it's not too hard to do. I'd say so. You just have to really carefully think about those things, which a lot of people just don't do. Uh, and don't know about about those things in the first place. So, how could we start there? And what would good good examples be for that? Like, how could you dial in a guitar tone with the mix in mind? What could be what could potential problem areas be? And 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 all those things. Right. Yeah. So so common things for me, and like I said earlier, I I have the luxury of working with like live recorded drums that I know are going to be something that I I continue to work with in the finished mix. But uh, like making the high end of the guitar mesh with the cymbals is something that I'm totally concerned about and 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 paying attention to, yeah, especially if there's like a crash and bash course or or any section of the song where it's like somebody riding the crash. That relationship just has to work. Um, you you have to compare like the top end of your distorted guitar against that, and and if it's not fitting, that that could mean a number of things. But it, it just kind of has to get resolved. Right, and and like yeah, like what the uh, I record bass um, usually after guitars, <laughs> uh, but uh, but for since Benny, when, I guess you do guitars when, first. Since when do you record bass after guitars? Um, uh, or sorry, sorry, no, I said that totally backwards. I said that totally backwards. I do not <laughs> I record for a bass second. I guitars. thought you finally you finally got it, but no. 
<laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> For anybody new to the to podcast, do. there's an ongoing feud about this that that will one day add, end the show and our friendship. But uh, until then, <laughs> we coexist. Um, yep. uh, so I I I can kind of figure out who's filling up the low mid and how when I'm dialing in my guitar tone to that bass track that's recorded, right? I've got a kick drum, I've got a bass guitar um, that are both existing and that shapes kind of a, a bottom end found foundation of my mix. So I can think about how the guitars are relating to that as we're choosing our guitar tone as well, which I find super helpful and yet one more reason to record bass first, as you should. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But I, I agree actually. Uh, no, I actually. I actually agree with the point though here. Um, so bass guitar relationship, bass symbols relationship. Uh, no, not bass symbols, guitar symbols relationship. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, um, it's an everything relationship. It, it, it's yeah. so important to have scratch tracks for your vocal and, and keys by this point because it, this really educates your guitar um, yeah. tone decision. Having you know, you're going to replace the vocal. You're going to replace those keys probably. Whatever. Um, you, you know, the leads, lead guitar layers that are there are probably going to get replaced. But they all the parts they tell you stuff about what frequencies are going to get used, even if they're going to change a little bit. So it's yeah. really helpful having those in place. Yeah, for sure. So to me, I, tend, I like to think about it from, if we start, and that's where the, the frequency chart cheat sheet comes in handy. If you, like, when I explain things like that and you can follow along with what I'm saying now, that's really helpful. So again, go to the selfrecordingband.com slash frequency chart if you want to download that for free. So... When you think about the bottom end of the song, like the 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 low end, the bass, or yeah, it's the upper bass region, sort of the lower mid range, whatever you want to call it, the transition between bass and mid range, I'd say, is where the guitars start, where the low end of the guitar is. It's not super low low end, but it's still considered part of the yeah the low end of the whole song. If I start there, I have the the bass is very important there still, but the guitars also have useful content down there, and you have to make a decision of like. Who is going to do what? Like, how are the two going to blend together there without creating overall too much uh, there? You know, like when I when I have a guitar, when I have guitars with a lot of low end at like between 100 and 200 hertz or something, and I also have a bass that has that that has a lot going on there, and it has the the you know that's depends on the on the, the bass. And some some basses live lower than that. Others have a lot of content in that in that area. If if and if the bass and the guitar have that. And maybe even there's, there might even be a kick drum, you know, that's still living there and something. Something's got to give. You got to make a decision there. And maybe you have to make the guitars thinner because the bass is really important there. Or maybe you can cut out some something, uh, you can make space in the bass there because the, the fundamentals are actually lower than that anyways, and you don't need the bass there, but you want to have the guitar low end. But if you leave both in, chances are that it's going to get muddy. It's just too much in this upper bass area. And you got to be aware of that and 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 try and see what, what works for the song. So there's this transition between where the bass takes over the low end and where the guitar low end sort of starts. And then the whole mid-range is where a lot of things are going on. It's where the vocals live, it's where keys live, it's where guitars live. So you sort of got to have to to punch holes into your guitar tone to make all the other things fit in because the guitars are covering the whole mid-range basically if you let them they are a very broadband instrument especially distorted guitars and you you have to make space for other things if those other things are important and if they're even more important than the guitar like vocals you have to find the spot where the vocals really shine and you can't really change that because that depends on the key of the song the range of the vocalist the voice all of that so this is something you can't really change and you have to figure out where that is and then you might have to make space for that in the guitar tone and create a guitar tone that actually lets the voice come through, the vocal come through in those areas. And it, this is a very difficult part of mixing that took me quite a while to figure out because it's just there's so much going on in the mid range, and guitars are covering everything. and And making sure to 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 make space for everything while still keeping the guitar character intact is quite difficult to achieve. But I t I, I kind of like to think about it like that: that there's a transition from bass to guitar, and those that this has to work. Then there's the mid range where I have to decide which are the most important things and which element is supporting and which is like leading. And then up higher up in the spectrum, there's this this transition between guitars and cymbals or the strumming noise of an acoustic guitar or something that's higher up than the electric guitars. There's got to be a transition right. as well. And it sounds really weird if you have 
a very bright, fizzy guitar tone, but then very dark cymbals, for example. Sometimes that just is not a smooth tr transition. And the two don't go well together. Or the other way around, you might have a very dark guitar tone, but then overly bright cymbals, and the two don't really connect. So I'm not saying they have to be the same, but it has to feel right. It's And you have to experiment with that. And you'll notice with a little bit of experience that it's very important to get those transitions right so that the song as a whole feels right and feels correct. And that no, no element is like, sticking out in an unpleasant way, which can easily happen. Uh, th that's that's how I think about it. And that's why I chose guitar for this episode, because guitars are covering the whole, all of it almost. And you want the, the character, and guitars are obviously important, but at the same time, they have to get out of the way of almost everything else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you, it's, it's again, context is everything. So you might solo the guitar and be like, this is perfect. But then when you unsolo it, you're like, okay, we got to dial something back. You know, it can't be this aggressive or this distorted or whatever it is. That can really change. Um, you know, I want to jump into our individual processes because I feel like yeah. there's there's tricks and, and just like uh, approaches to this that make it easier because this sounds very technical mm -hmm. and it doesn't really have to be. Like it's it's not as technical as it sounds. When you break it down, it's a technical thing. But if you go at it artistically, I, I think it it's pretty natural if you make sure you check a, a couple boxes and and assess a couple things along the way. Benny, do you want to do you want to lead it and and talk no. through your your hunt? <laughs> no, you want me no, to go first? No, okay. no because uh that's one of the things I mentioned earlier to you Malcolm before we started recording. I usually love systems and processes and I have processes for a lot of things, but when it comes to dialing in guitar tones, it's to me it's a very or tones in general, it's a very intuitive sort of pro I guess it is a process, but it's hard for me to explain it because it it's I react to what what comes out of the speakers, and I just mm -hmm. do it pretty much. Right, um, and you know, so it's hard for me to explain that. Uh, just, so I, I'm curious to hear your your process, uh, and may, maybe sure. that's similar to what I do. I don't know. Okay, I I do think I've actually told this on the podcast before, but I, I stole it from a producer named Eric Ratz that my band worked with. Um, he's done like Big Rack, Billy Talent, Monster Truck, Arkells, like lots of big bands, especially in Canada, um, and some with incredibly awesome guitar tones. And and his approach like totally blew my mind, and it was fun. And and uh, pretty, like I said, it, it kind of takes all the technical stuff out of it. It also takes your bias out of it, which is really important, I think. Mm -hmm. And number one thing was choose the the guitar that we thought was going to be it. Just like our gut, just like choose your gut gut decision guitar. Um, if you're like most people, it's probably your guitar because you like your thing. <laughs> but uh, so you grab that and you grab your most likely amp as well. You'll say you're pretty much like your your go your gut for the whole chain, what you think the tone would be, and quickly mm -hmm. dial that in. It should sound approximately right. Um, and and again, quickly dial it in. So it's like fifty seven Marshall Les Paul. That's that's a rock sound. This is a rock song. Yeah. This is probably going to be. All right. Then he had me record from the intro of the song up to the end of the first chorus, uh, assuming like a verse or like, you know, riff, verse, chorus structure kind of thing, something like that. And then I would double it. And then he said, sweet, here's another guitar. We just swap the guitar. Don't even change the amp at all. Run the same thing again up until the end of the first chorus, double it. And then here's another guitar. We had like 11 guitars going. So luxury of guitars and time were had at this, but if you're a self-recording band, you got time. So uh, this this works. And we just shot out all of the guitars that at least had a shot. You know, if it if it was like a strat with no humbucker in it and it was totally a humbucker song, we didn't bother with the strat. But otherwise all of the guitars got recorded and and doubled like that through that same thing. And then we just had them on playlists and we had the luxury of having a, an assistant engineer that could play it back to us and we wouldn't know which one we're listening to. We just he just randomized them in an order, and then we'd listen through in an order he knew, and then we'd all vote which one we liked. And it usually wasn't my gut choice, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I thought very interesting. Uh, uh, and so I would choose, and you know, I sometimes I'd be like, "Oh, number three is my favorite. I think that's my guitar," and it might not be my guitar. But what was interesting was that everybody in the room almost always chose the same number. So. Again, it's like, okay, number three, I don't know what that was, but that's my favorite. If the whole room, and there's like five people in the room, are like, yeah, number three was the clear winner. And it just totally removed 
all of the ego from it and and the, the you know like the bias of like okay this guitar is fun to play it feels good to play but it was just just what sounds best and uh, and every once in a while there was like a case okay, between three and five option three and number five we still don't know what they are and Eric would be like okay what do you like about five and I'd be like oh like it's just a little more fizzy he's like yeah but what do you think about the snare when you compare them it's like oh yeah the snare kind of like doesn't have any attack anymore. And he's like, okay, mm-hmm. so what do you think? And I was like, okay, yeah, we should go with three. Three just doesn't doesn't have that cost. And and it just, again, you don't know which one's which until after you've made your decision. Then we'd just be like, okay, number three it is. What guitar is that? He'd be like, okay, it's the SG. Sweet. Grab the SG. And then we tweak from there. Then awesome. we start being like, okay, should should we change the speaker? Should we add a mic for for whatever we're looking for? But but that process like led to the right emotion, uh, like ticking that first box. Uh, it led to us considering the frequency arrangement of what's already existing. Like, does it complement the drums and all of the other tracks we have in there? And and the arrangement decision is kind of made by choosing. I mean, that that's kind of a part thing as well. I guess we had that done in pre pro. I guess, but yeah, it it, it was just a, a repeatable process that has never failed me when I when we have the time to do it. Awesome. That's so cool. So you mean, you're saying that the the fact that you do basically you do uh, blind tests and um, and so you you remove the bias is is one of the biggest parts to this. I think like one of the biggest. Uh, yeah, 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 and mostly like work. honestly, it's mostly shooting out guitars and realizing that that's a way bigger decision than you'd think. Is getting the right guitar is is so important. Um, so. Like I have a Kemper, and I've got some amp sims that I now love as well. And it, I, I kind of do the same thing, even if we're not doing it blind. And like in my room, there's there's two guitars on the wall right beside me. Normally, there's a couple more, but like two to three guitars are always around. So we choose the one we think. Maybe it's on the Kemper. Find a quick tone that seems right. Okay, this is sounding good. Quickly plug in that guitar. Let's just see, just to see. And and if it's only two, we're not going to do a blind test. It's going to be like, okay, that one's a clear winner. Here we go. Um, but it's always worth just shooting out that guitar i think yeah yeah totally totally and yeah and and it, it's also interesting that when you say like almost every every time everybody in the room had the same op- opinion this just goes to show that you don't have to necessarily know all the technical things and you don't have to even have the same terms necessarily and all the knowledge but yeah. like everybody reacts to the music and usually there is a constant and there's a, a right and a wrong decision oftentimes and and it's about, and it also goes to show that it's, it's just about how it feels. It's, you know, not about the numbers or anything like that. It's just, how does it feel? And most of the time, everybody in the room agrees that one feels better than the other. They might not yeah. be able to articulate it, but they know that it's better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and once you've got that, like, honestly, once you have the right guitar for the job, choosing the amp and all that kind of starts falling into place really quickly, I think. I think so too. I think so too. Yeah, awesome. Now, hearing all that, I think... I think I do have a process, and and I I have never done the whole blind thing with the whole band in the room like you just described. That's a, actually a very good idea and a very cool thing to do. Um, I mean, I obviously talk to the band and we we try it together, but it's not really that that sort of blind thing that we do uh, or did when I was still recording. But what I do, I think, is to me the the overall vision of where the whole project is supposed to go is always super important like the big picture thing like what are you trying to achieve what do you want to sound like which bands do you look up to or, 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 what, what is your aesthetic what is your identity as a band and then i guess i have a few go to's overall not about guitars but overall i have a few things that i know work for different for different things and they are starting points but they work so when, when somebody tells me they want to have a modern sounding very polished rock sound that could be on the radio, for example. I know that I need a pretty sweet, expensive sounding top end, for example. Mm-hmm. And I probably need pretty bright cymbals in a lot of cases. Um they don't they can't be harsh, but it has to be bright. It has to be loud. Um it has to there, there has to be clarity in the vocal and all that. So overall it's gonna be probably a relatively bright, polished mix. And if I know that, I immediately have an idea of a guitar tone in mind also. And the and the other way around, if somebody tells me that they are I don't know a stoner rock band or some alternative rock band or indie band, and it's it's a darker, fuzzier overall vibe and less polished, more orga- organic, whatever whatever that means, or more room where the sound travels through air more and it's like darker. And um, I have a a sound in mind for that too. And I have these as starting points for the overall aesthetic, and that makes choosing the the, the right guitar tone a little easier for me because it automatically rules out some of the options almost. Mm. And 
things like the slick top end and modern and polished sort of go together often with a little bit of a scooped mid-range and a full thick bottom end, clear top end, but a, a, um, yeah, a con, sort of a, a clean mid-range with where the vocals are really intelligible and where it's like the separation is great and all of that. While um, a more aggressive, organic thing or something fuzzier that's a little more unruly, whatever, that can have a little almost like a muddy mid-range sometimes intentionally it's it's more this wall of sound thing than the separation you know so i don't know that's probably what i do is i think of the overall like big picture and and i immediately have some go tos tos and then i will cycle through those and see if it works and oftentimes it's a very natural thing because the bands come in with that sort of gear anyway and that sort of a vision in mind but oftentimes it's actually not sometimes it's it's that what we said before in other episodes that they want a modern metal sound, but what they have is a Fender Strat and some Vox amp or whatever that's yep. not completely not will not never do what they want to do. Um, and in that case, obviously, we need to change things. Yeah, yeah but that's yep. that's I, I think um, what I what I think about. And one great example of where of this conflict that can happen so often, even with like experienced musicians, I had this with my own band. Well, I have this all the time, actually. But with my own band, we had just a discussion about the current EP that I'm mixing for us and uh, that I'm that we're working on. And our one of our guitar players, he like Martin, he's a big fan of like dark, full sounding guitars. He likes mid range forward, but not aggressive mid range, but lower mid range forward guitars, right. where it's almost like barking. You know, it's heavily distorted in a way. It's like hardcore punk, but it's not a really high gain. So it's it's distorted enough so that you can have palm mutes. And it's aggressive, but it's almost barking and has this 800, you know, almost like lower mid-range forward thing. That That's what he personally likes. When he stands in front of his amp, it's rather dull, but full in the mid-range, and that's what he enjoys. And it's difficult because our songs are pretty fast. There is um, a lot of backing vocals going on. There's melodies, lead guitar and octaves and all these things. And his guitar, his vision of a good guitar tone is like taking over the, the, the all of the mid range basically. And it's very hard to make that work in the context of our genre and our mix. And I also so it's always this balance of how can I make a tone that satisfies his vision of a perfect guitar tone while also serving our songs. And then he showed me some references where I'm like, yeah, we can do that, but listen to that song again that you just sent me. Do you really want the vocals to be that buried? Do you really want the snare to be that buried? Do you really, you know, all these things? And then he was like, oh, you're right. Maybe we can't go that far, you know? So this is a good example of a, a good real life example where somebody just likes a certain guitar aesthetic and ignores the fact that it has to fit into the mix, maybe. Right. Yeah. It, it It's totally true. I, I Something I find may be funny, and I could be wrong with some of these, but I feel like, I'm trying to think of an example. Honestly, Slash. Let's use Slash. And I, I could be so wrong here, but I feel like Slash doesn't care. <laughs> like, he's so good. It's going to sound good. It's a guitar tone. You know, like, I, I don't think he obsesses over what comes out of the speaker when he goes into the studio these days. He probably did when he first got started. But like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's going to yeah. sound like yeah, Slash, right? And, yeah. and so, meanwhile, there's like, Everybody reading Guitar World magazine, looking at his rig, being like, "I got to get yeah. these guitar cables between my pedals to make it happen." The same, and he's probably just like, walks in. All right, are you ready? Click record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, and and it's just good, right? Um, and I, so I, I think some people think that guitar tone is this very personal thing, but in reality, it it's like for me, it, it's it couldn't be less personal. I really care that it's about like the, that the song sounds amazing as a whole. But like the guitar tone isn't my identity. It's like the result of the song is, and the performance is really a, the the main concern. Yep, totally. That's so great. Like we're not creating a guitar tone. We're creating a song that will connect with the listener. Nobody will ever care about the guitar tone. All they care <laughs> yeah. about is do they like the song or not. You know. Yeah, totally. And if the song's good and the performance is good, they're they're gonna think that tone's good regardless to if it is really. You know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Yeah, I like that. Cool. I hope, th- yeah, I'm pretty sure you can you can take something away from this episode. And I think the main thing for you to take away here is is that you actually think about those things. Honestly, it's not so much about the the actionable the, the yeah the actionable things and the ho- and the hows. It's it's about being aware that it's important that that the context is important and that you shouldn't create tones in a vacuum and that what matters is the song and not the guitar tone. That's actually. That's all you need to know here. Yeah. And we hopefully gave you some starting points. You hopefully downloaded that cheat sheet because it is really helpful. Uh, and the rest is like experimenting and just being aware of that. Just 
taking the time to sit down and think about those things, like good songwriters do, good arrangers do, good producers do, they think about those things. They think about how all the individual elements create this piece of art together. You know, they don't think about the guitar tone, they think about the whole thing, and then they make decisions based on that. And as long as you do that, you're you're good. And all the, the rest of it is basically experimenting and having, and you can speed things up by having good starting points. And that's what we hope, hope to do and to help you with with this with this episode. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you probably picked up that a lot of what we do is like by instinct now, and that that does come with experience. Like like I said, with, with even with the guitar shootout method, you quickly dial in a tone that you think is going to be close. That might be hard starting out. That might not be as easy as I made it sound, just getting something that's in the ballpark. Um, so, I mean, there's this work that's got to be put in. you got to experiment, test out the gear you have, um, and, and you'll just get better and better at kind of getting something quickly. Um, and yeah. maybe that's not the final thing, but uh, just, you know, put in the work. Yeah, totally. And the, the final thing I want to say is, because you said it's going to be hard, another thing that's going to be hard is probably being okay with the fact that when you hit solo, when you have the, the right guitar tone, everything works, and then you hit solo and listen to the guitars, it might sound like it's lacking something. It doesn't have to, but can. And you have to be you have to be cool with the fact that the guitar and solo might not exactly what you thought it would be, but mm -hmm. in the context of the mix, it totally works. And that takes some practice in and of itself, because again, as the title of the, the episode was, like your sick guitar tone might be ruining your mix and it could so that means on its own it could be sick but in the context of the mix it could not just not work and the other way around is true too so be okay with the fact that it's a great mix and it works and what the guitar sounds like on its own doesn't really matter except for if there's a section where the guitar is on its own and then you can automate or create a second tone but as long as everything's playing together the individual tone doesn't matter and that I know from experience takes a while to get used to and to yep. be okay with because you want to make everything perfect and uh yeah but that's not what it what matters what matters is the the whole thing absolutely okay one one last thing that i thought of <laughs> if like, we live in a, a world where doubled guitars are the norm right um it is very common to have a left and a right matching pair yeah if you if that's how your recording is going to be you have to build your tone that way because a, a guitar Mono sounds totally different than once you've got two of them playing together. Um, oh, yeah, the, sure. the, the tones kind of uh, amplify what's going on. So if it's distorted and it's, and heavy with one, and then you add a second one, it might be way too distorted all of a sudden. It might be way too trebly all of a sudden. Like it, you've got to uh, you've got to record it twice and just listen to it that way, as if it's one thing. I, I think that's really important because I think people tend to overdo it, thinking that it's like okay, it's got to be dirtier. But if they just left it a little cleaner and then recorded that double, they would have it would have seemed dirty enough, kind of thing. Um, it's a it's an e easy way to overdo distortion, especially um, if you don't record a double and then check what that sounds like in the mix. Does that make yeah. sense? Did I explain that? <laughs> to totally, totally. Okay. I was just thinking about it because, yeah. But uh, no, not because. It totally makes sense. Great. Yeah. Think about think about the double. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Period. Yep. There's a there's a <laughs> lot in that episode. If you want. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, see you next week. That's all I have yeah. to say. Thank we'll you, Kevin. Thank you for li care. for listening. Bye bye.